I think uh, like we would like to start with uh, questions um, from us, and then we will open to the public, of course. But let me ask you the first question, and it would be a general one, uh, trying to link all the talks. Uh, what I think is crucial here, if these are new um, ideas uh, of politics and what is political art or political movement, uh, what does it mean today? And uh, if I understood you uh, correctly, this is uh, you are trying to call for something that would be in contrast to the identity politics that we are quite used to now. Uh, and in those very different ways and in those very different approaches we see the project of uh, some kind of community solidarity contact zone that would, uh, that would uh, enable us to see something beyond the identity, uh, something, uh, let's say, different, oppositional or maybe our next level of uh, thinking about politics. And uh, my question would be uh, like this. What is the place of aesthetics in this political uh, thinking? How do you perceive it? Is it still like in the year reading aesthetics as politics or it's some kind uh, or can we see some kind of change, some kind of new postulate, some kind of different relation between what's aesthetical and political in context of commonality? The argument is uh, open. You can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's start. So I, I uh, guess it depends what you mean by aesthetics. If you mean art, in the old definition, the, um, the definition made by moderns, uh, who see the autonomy of arts and a special experience connect, connected with art, the so-called uh, aesthetics experience as being some, something special uh, and, in a sense, put in a dichotomic relation to the life experience. So in this case, I guess, we uh, are uh, moving towards not having this kind of aesthetics. But on the other hand, you may uh, define aesthetics as uh, Rancière did um, in, uh, in, in, uh, going back to the roots of aesthetics. Uh, and then I see it will be on the same level in the other experiences. It will be a kind of, uh, an, uh, of a laboratory, of a hot bed for speculating about future. Because in a sense, what's important for me is the difference on uh, Isabel Stenger's insisting upon uh, when looking back to Whitehead and the um, difference between uh, le probable and le possible. Probable being um, something which is already uh, a, a kind of model you may use to foresee what will be the future life, and le possible, everything other which is not foreseeable, so for could be for touchable, could be for um, tasteable, for uh, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So. I, I guess that what's important it's really this kind of hands-on working on the future, not not modeling it in the real laboratories, but by trying to survive. And art could be a way of surviving as, as well. <laughs> If you want me to, okay. All right. Well, I mean, I, I'm, I can't really speak to, this, to a specific role for, you know, fine art, for example. I mean, apart from anything, I think whether or not there is a specific role for things like fine art practice is entirely a conjunctural and contingent question. You know, sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't. It depends on the nature of its relations with other things that are going on. Um, but broadly speaking, I mean, there's clearly an aesthetic, I mean, what we might call an aesthetic dimension to all social and political experience. That you know, but all, all political experience, or even the most mundane forms of political organisation, involve 
an affective dimension and involve a certain mix. Um, so, I mean, certainly in the in the sort of UK at the moment on the on the, on the sort of political left, there's a lot of interest in in the way in which you know this experience of um, I mean, just the experience of going out campaigning for people in those pictures that I showed is a is has a very specific kind of emotional quality, a very specific affective quality, and a very specific you know it's, it is an aesthetic experience as much as it's anything else. Um, I mean, it does pose a question for what the role is of uh, of you know for types of practice that are sort of primarily aesthetic and kind of only aesthetic. And I think it's a, it's a challenge for traditions, for certain strands, say, of conceptual and relational art, that, they, they, you, that it's often quite difficult, they have to answer the question to some extent, not just what kind of experiences are you trying to produce, but what, if you're trying to produce those kinds of experiences, why would you do it here? I mean, that's always been my, you know, I mean, it was always my critique of relational art. Like most, most claims made for most relational art practices, that, my, my answer is always the same, well, if, if that's what you want to achieve, why don't you just put on a party? And why, don't, why are you doing that? Like, if, <laughs> if you want to pr promote intense experiences of relationality and in indeterminacy, then just have a ray. You know, it's not giving people soup in the gallery is a, is a less good way of doing that. So I think then there's a question, well, what is the, what is the specific function? I mean, there certainly are specific functions, there are specific ways in which um, you know, aesthetic practices and, and even fine art practices and gallery practices can serve as a sort of, uh, they can serve as, have a kind of laboratory function, they can serve as a function, they can have a kind of, they can be sites at which certain kinds of, um, certain ways of arranging experience and arranging, and, you know, distributing sensibilities, you know, in the Montserrat term, can be, can be experimented with. I think what's important then is to try to think about, I mean, it's one of the things that the, the Creative Commons uh, project, for example, is, is trying to think about. Is well then how do you then, how do you connect them with broader um, sort of institutional practices? I think that's that's the challenge. I think that's the, I think especially if we're talking about the kind of, you know, the sort of global art scene at the moment, is there is a real, it's quite difficult, it's very easy to get some space and like put, put on an event or create an installation and make a set of claims for its political valency. Uh, the, the challenge, I think, comes at the immediate point after that, usually, where, it, where, you, where you would, if you were really going to carry, realise that potentiality, you would have to create some kind of institutional kind of connection with broader social struggles or broader, or just kind of social activity, you know, in the, um, out, outside the, the art space. And where that can be done, I think, then the practice still has a lot of potential. But where you, where you just sort of shrug your shoulders and, and give up on the possibility of doing that, and I think it, then there's there is always a risk that it becomes a substitute for any, any kind of effective sort of political intervention. So I think it depends on it depends on what I, I call the strategic orientation of the institution and of the, and of the practice itself. I think it you know that it has to it doesn't I don't think that the artist the art practice has to have a, a grand strategy, but I think it has to have a strategic orientation. It, it, however minimal. So this kind of this early two thousands is this very popular idea of the tactical, the tactical art, tactical media. To me, that was completely misplaced because the, the tactical was just a substitute. Right? The tactical meant you, you were proud of not having a strategy, and that meant that in practice, what that meant, your art practice would inevitably be captured by capital. It would just become you were developing techniques which, which would get translated into marketing campaigns. So I think my answer. So I think I, I think. Um, so I would say that I would say that the, the strategic orientation is always very important, and, the, and it's, but it's important not to confuse that with an imagined need for some absolute strategy, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think the aesthetic still has kind of a very important function also today when you look at it like this um, maybe phenomenon or something which can, can open us up and kind of surprise us and helps to, to create the space where these things can happen. But I think maybe to the, today now, less than ever before, and the aesthetic is not restricted to like the field of arts. And it can be found like almost everywhere. Whereas it also can be produced intentionally, I think, in this, this space where something happens with, with us, where we are affected or we are moved from, from like our where we are always uh, like repeating, I don't know, our 
us or um, how, how we feel, how we act. And um, this little change, which also is like sometimes temporarily, sometimes we can switch back to how we were before, but I think this kind of produced intentionally through some piece of art or so. You are more than welcome to intervene at any stage, so if you have questions, please raise your hands and I will ignore you because I have my own question <laughs> first, uh, but I will know already that, that you're waiting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now it's very, very complicated. <laughs> yeah, the joke just turned against myself. But uh, yeah, it would be, I guess, not a very long one. Uh, but I think that there is a common uh, common issue here, and I think, and I really appreciate uh, that you all, in some sense, uh, created a sort of archaeology uh, of where we are today. Different kinds of uh, archaeological uh, inquiry into how uh, did it happen that we finished at this point, uh, at this moment. I mean, not here today, uh, this archaeology is still to, to be done, but... Uh, uh, and I think that uh, in various ways you are touching upon the question of how uh, is it possible to invent a split, like in language, in practices, in imagination, in epistemology and so on, which would be a function, um, which would be very functional, on the one hand, and on the other would totally dismiss any attempts to, to create an alternative. Yeah? So, how you create a neoliberal world in which collectivities are welcome only under condition of their effectivity in a very uh, uh, well-defined and very limited uh, uh, world view, then how you construct even a multicultural discourse which again would repeat the same logic and thus create a total imbalance or inequality and I think that the historical uh, in a most positivist uh, sense historical uh, example of Poland in 68 would be also uh, about how to create a parallel universe in which by the way Poles now live uh, more than ever this is really insane to, to what extent the, the narratives never meet. So my question here, apart from uh, uh, underscoring this fact, would be uh, about the backlash. Because uh, about the notion of the backlash. backlash. Dorota's backlash. Or back, backlash? Backlash? Backlash. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, Dorota started with, with the question uh, uh, of the uh, populist politics and uh, the return of the far right, or, uh, or, and my question uh, here would be a very simple one, is it really a return and a move backwards? Because that presupposes that the previous one was a move forward. <laughs> and in some sense these two movements are in opposition to each other. And when uh, I was listening to uh, to your talk about uh, you know the defeat of the left. It's not at all true. I mean that that's exactly the continuation of what happened. Yeah, because you said democracy is potentiation of complex uh, collect collectivities. Yes, so neoliberalism started with uh, cancelling the compli complexi complexity complexity uh, mm -hmm. problem, and then all the forms of community that would could return would be uh, very uh, simplistic ones. Yes, so that's why far right is uh, uh, so well off now, yeah? because uh, that's the language prepared for their discourse. So, so that, that's the question about the backlash or a continuation in these circumstances. And again, the order is free. <laughs> <laughs> So the question is, I mean, the question is, is it, yeah, how, how do we sort of understand the, the emergence of the, the, the emergence of a, a contemporary form of the far right in, in sort of chronological, you know, his, historical terms, and is it, 
I mean, it's certainly, I think it is a, it's a reaction, but that doesn't mean it's a return. Like, I agree, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not the same thing, because it's not happening partly just because the conditions are very different. I mean, you know, fascism, I mean, it's not a new point, it's a point made by people like Sigmund Bauman, people that, you know, fascism was, very, was absolutely a product of kind of Fordist modernity. I mean, you know, it was dependent on a particular set of industrial conditions, I mean, as was social democracy. Um, that's what Stalinism. So clearly, the conditions, yeah, the conditions are different. And I think also, I mean, importantly, I think to some extent, since the, I mean, to some extent, I mean, the periodization of these things is quite complicated as well because, I mean, there's a lot of talk at the moment about a sort of resurgence of the populist right. But I think I don't really. I mean, if you try to if you trace the chronologies in different countries, they're, they're very discontinued. So the France, the, the, I mean in France, for example, the FN has been growing steadily since the 70s. It's not a new phenomenon in any way. It's, um, the, situation, um, the situation in places like Germany and Poland are quite distinctive, quite different from each other. Um, I would say, to some extent, I mean, for example, the situation in India is, a, is, a, is really a culmination of what the, of the process that begins in the 70s, when the sort of... Um, I mean, really, the 70s is the moment when you see, alongside, actually, the global, the sort of hegemony of, of the Anglo-American hegemony of neoliberalism and, and its imposition in Latin America, you also see the emergence of politicised forms of religious and ethnic sort of politics, that, um, and all these forms, including Hindutva, including, <laughs> including the, the recodification of Zionism as a completely right-wing project, including um, the turn of the evangelical right in the United States, the evangelical Christian movement to the political right in the state, which had been, had been anti-political before the 1970s, it hadn't been associated with the, with the right in that way. So all of these things, all of these things are associated actually with the kind of crisis of the 70s and the crisis and, you know, the, the kind of multifaceted crisis, which you know, I think you know, is, is the product of so the defeat, the defeat of the global the wave of democratic demands which manifested itself in 1968 in the same places, in the same in the context. So, I think in that sense, I mean, this is, people like Wolfgang Street will say this, that in some sense, really trying to see, try, most, most commentary which sees something very, very specific happening recently um, is quite problematic. And in some sense, I mean, if we, I mean, Wolfgang Street argues that basically, and I think it's quite persuasive, I mean, in a sense, that the crisis, the crisis of, of post-war democracy and, and post-war capitalism, which, it, which we say say in the 70s, has never really been resolved, actually. It, just, it hasn't been resolved, did it? There was a very temporary fix made in places like Europe and America through, through exporting manufacturing to China and through vastly inflating sort of personal and government debt to enable very high levels of consumption to carry on so that nobody worried too much about the fact that real wages were declining, that profitability was declining. And, uh, and the, the democratic, the democratic gains of the mid 20th century were in retreat or were over the place. Uh, so in that sense, I think this sort of answer. I think you've raised. I think that you know, that's basically the time I would answer. Actually, I would say that what you're pointing to, in fact, it is is the fact that in some sense, it's quite, you know, it's very superficial to say there's been a recent resurgence of the populist right. And in fact, what we're seeing are symptoms of the fact that the crisis, which the crisis which breaks in the 70s, is still really not resolved. It's still really not. Not my own fan. Well, I think for me also, I mean, this is, isn't a return to like things how they were before, also like referring to Poland, for example. I mean, I'm maybe not an expert on, on the, the actual situation, but even though. Sorry? No one is. <laughs> Even though we also have like this, this split reality and like two fields of discourse that we can't really dis discuss anymore with each other because like also the terminologies, the words, everything is like completely different. It's it still isn't the same like it was before because like the the conditions were different and also the I don't know global interactions were also quite different. So I think this is maybe it has like similar traits and. This, this split of, um, of realities or discourses, but for sure I would say it's like a new form, it's maybe kind of a spiral along like realities that are coming closer to each other and uh, 
increasing again. And now we have like a bigger split again. Okay, you both, um, you both spoke about um, political politics uh, and so I will address two other sides of the problem. Namely, um, Pavel um, gave us a kind of neat model with this backward, uh, forward and backward movement and I uh, would like to have some lunacy in it addressing um, a problem or an issue of uh, so-called um, archaeology of future because it's quite important this movement towards archaeology of the future and also it was an exposition um, about ecology and many of the um, uh, works are there were, uh, were, were, uh, were uh, demonstrating an artifacts from the future as found by the archaeologists. It started, I guess, with Ursula Le Guin and uh, uh, always coming again, but it's, it's now very popular, this kind of, of uh, coming back to the future for uh, uh, complicating this straight movement forwards and backwards. Um, that, that, uh, the, another point I'd like to address, I was all the time that uh, Nina was speaking, I was thinking, What's so um, enerving in, in the English translation of, of the uh, Konvitsky's novel uh, title? Uh, because, in a sense, it's a kind of backlash, but um, done in a, a minor way, not to be um, not to be noticed. But nevertheless, it is there because the title, the Polish title, is Zwierzę człowieka. Opium, so it should be translated of beast of human and uh, ghost. In a sense, it will be the direct translation. And here it was Anthropos at the, at the very beginning. So it was Anthropos, ghost, and then beast. And uh, I wonder uh, how it uh, influenced the reader when they're thinking about human as being at the very top of this um, of this uh, series. So, uh, in this sense, uh, Konvitsky was post-humanly <laughs> and more progressive than this English translation, which is for me a kind of backlash <laughs> into, you know, uh, influencing the people in such a way as to not let notice them that they are. Uh, just uh, telling them the Anthropos is still very, very important. And so maybe now it's time for your questions. Uh, no, not anymore. Excuse me, I have a bad hip. I have to keep standing up a little bit. So, um, uh, so uh, one thing that made me really happy until Nina gave her talk was it was a kind of optimistic panel, <laughs> which often in uh, academic circles one doesn't have. And then Nina reminded us that it's always been bad, even in 1968, which is <laughs> usually the moment that people say everything went downhill. So I, I, I'm a little bit uh, it gloomy again at the end, but I'm, I'm, I, I am thinking there is something very optimistic that is going on. And I, it interests me a lot, um, the haptic, but I wanted to bring into the discussion uh, 2011, and not just what happened in Spain, or what happened in Greece, but also what happened in uh, uh, the Mar uh, the Maghreb and so many other places in the world, and what keeps happening every day now in Hong Kong or Sudan or whatever. In other words, I, I, um, on the one hand, I think it's really important to pull out of one's own British or US or Polish experiences something that you know is um, it gives us an anchor for our present situation. On the other, I, I think we have to really 
acknowledge that, you know, this is the end of Western civilization, thank God. It was not all that good, and it's going down ever so slightly, and, you know, and let's get out of any notion that now China's going to come in and be the new civilization, because that's not what I'm aiming at. I'm just saying that a certain moment of hegemony is destroyed, so much the better, right? But also for inspiration, um, uh, for solidarity, which I love for the discussion of what it means today and the way we've learned a lot. We've learned, it's not just a tradition that we're building up, but we've learned through past narrowness, uh, two kinds of narrowness, uh, working class narrowness, but also the narrowness of identity politics. Uh, I think that's really, really helpful. So maybe I would just make my question be this. Is there a way that we can make the complexities uh, uh, evident in the ways that you were speaking that would be inclusive of what is happening every day now around the world, but simply not uh, perhaps as strongly in Europe or the United States? <laughs> okay. um, it, it's difficult because I guess that we already passed, you know, the, uh, another uh, easy dichotomy between the, the West and the rest. And that's for, uh, why for me so important was uh, Sousa de Santos with um, this many modernities or something which is part of Western experience but was not part of the so-called Western epistemy. So it, we still not in the, in, the, uh, in the way of thinking global north, global south, but um, looking at the um, European philosophies or the European knowledges and experiences, which are parallel or alternative to the, to the, um, to the mainstream and to the so-called Western epistemy, if we go back but this time in a more positive way, before the um, um, uh, 70th century, we will see a kind of really richness of ways of uh, uh, life, uh, ways of practices uh, and uh, different approaches to knowledges as well. So it's not that we just have to go to other parts of the world to um, seek help there. But um, uh, what, is, um, what is standing in our way as academics, as I see it, is so-called scientific knowledge which was put on the very top of the hierarchy of knowledges as the ultimate objective way of preserving uh, reality. And in this sense, the back backlash here is the, all the discussion about um, fake news and uh, post-truth and uh, all this um, discussion and um, journalistic political influences which not allow us to speak so openly about different knowledges being at, at the end just now. Because uh, if I'm talking with my students, they, we have many different knowledges, many different truths. For them, it's already kind of smelling after the uh, fake news and, uh, and the post-truth um, um, post um, uh, era, so to say. Thank you. Um, thank you for this very after your comment, and for me, for example, it's, it's also when it comes to pluralism or plurality of views on the world, um, which is always kind of, I don't know, challenging for me, for example, as a Swiss scholar looking at a, a Polish field which was uh, now I'm studying like a field which was located in, or temporarily located in, in communism which is always the question of can I, can I actually read what I read or is it, is it kind of a completely strange way of reading things and other people or people living in Poland in the 1960s were really completely different. Um, 
I did last year an, a reading of a film called Race. And <laughs> I, I was told it was like a completely kind of extravagant. <laughs> But uh, apparently people kind of liked it because it kind of gave it a new view, view of, uh, of looking at this film. So maybe it, it, it can kind of help even though it's Poland and Switzerland is not like so far away from each other and we kind of have an exchange as well. <laughs> but yeah, and what I was also thinking about, especially um, after your talk, when I was using this, this word um, transhuman, um, and I kind of, kind of replaced it by transspecies because I realized that I was also still going, <coughs> coming from this humanist centrist perspective when I call it transhuman as transgressing the human but not like... Um, Being between. Yeah, it's exactly like looking at everything from a, from a, I don't know, an equal perspective. Uh, yeah, maybe I just drift it off a bit of the topic. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Well, yeah, okay. Well, I mean, of course, I mean, the fact that, you know, the, the challenge, the political, not just the political, I mean, well, I mean, it's all political, but even just the political, the human, even the extra human, the kind of biological challenge posed by the consequences of industrial capitalism sort of requires a sort of global response and a sort of internationalist perspective. It's something we've known since the mid 19th century. So, and I mean, it hasn't stopped being true. And it hasn't stopped being enormously challenging you know, to actually sort of materialise that. So I think, I mean, the banal answer to your question is just, well, yes, I mean, it's, it's possible and it's necessary. It's still, I mean, I think we're still, you know, it's very, um, it's a real challenge. I mean, uh, and it's a real challenge. I mean, from a UK perspective, it's a real challenge that people don't, uh, we've got a very specific situation that because of the language, you know, people know a lot about what's happening in the States. So. And I'm also, you know, my, I mean, some of my, I've got, a, you know, my mother's American, I've got American families so here. There's been a real, real change in the past 20 years, actually, in terms of how much people in the States, who are, maybe these people who are interested, and know what know about what's happening in Britain. I'm kind of amazed constantly you know, by how much people know about what's happening in the UK. Because they, they didn't used to know anything. And, um, and, um, and that's something, but people in Britain don't know anything about what's happening in the rest of Europe, like at all. There's no, it doesn't feature. Culture. People have no idea. Like, no, no, no. And, and that's a very deliberate project, actually. It's part of the conditions for Brexit. It's a very deliberate on the part of British political class, which has always been obsessively Atlanticist in its orientation and has always been afraid that if people in Britain knew what was happening, what, what, West, what, what was happening in Western Europe, then they, they wouldn't accept even Atlanticist foreign policy or, a, or, or the neoliberals, apparently, actually. And it's true they wouldn't have done. Um, it was only by being constantly um, given a vision of the world that was the only other, the only other bit of the world is America. So uh, our childcare provision is at least better than theirs. So our healthcare is at least better than theirs. So that was always part of the condition of, for sort of neoliberal hegemony. Um, but I don't, I don't have a very easy answer in terms of what. I don't have a very easy answer in terms of what. You know, um, yeah, you know how you overcome that. I think it's. You know, I think it's, it's just it's an ongoing work, it's an ongoing challenge um, to promote kind of a, you know, yeah, adequately global or even, even adequately international perspectives. Um, I think, um, I mean, I think in terms of, you know, just in terms of optimism and pessimism, well, I don't, I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I, you know, sort of, cate you know, sort of efficiently, categorically, I try to, you know, abstain from any optimism or pessimism. It's not a, you know, it's not a philosophical, neither is a philosophically viable position, like probably, but it's also, um, it's very difficult. If you've been sort of acting on the left in the English speaking world for the past, for, for decades, not just for five years, but like, you know, since the 80s, it's, it's difficult, it's very difficult to avoid recognizing how, you know, the, the extent of kind of mobilization, especially of young people now, is, is very different from anything that has been for, for a couple of decades. So it's difficult not to feel cheered up. Like even if the imminent prospects don't feel that great, like actually it doesn't. It's very difficult not to feel cheered up. I mean, and I think I mean I mean I've got a um, I think there is and I think uh, you know clearly one clearly one of the major issues 
if anyone only mentioned, he, he's the consequences of the, of the, of the massive kind of technological paradigm which, that we shift that we're living through, the fact that, and the consequences of the sort of new phase and I, of capitalism. And I think, I mean, I've, I've got a, I sort of wrote a journal article earlier this year, it's not published yet, which is partly trying to look at the kind of, you know, the way the, the sort of cycles of optimism and pessimism around the internet and the digital technology, which is kind of, just kind of go with sort of almost sort of relentless predictability now. So at first it was all going to be brilliant, but this isn't the first time it's all been terrible. Like in the early 2000s, when, basically when the, when the, when the dot-com bubble burst in the early 2000s, suddenly, you know, people got all kinds of mileage out, out of pointing out how bad it was. And my, my friend Tatiana Taranova has made an entire career out of, out of having written one short essay about how people were getting ripped off working in the internet economy. And, um, Incredible. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that amount of she's got out of that. And, um, and uh, right now, this year has been a, you know, this year, you know, there's been this big wave of kind of pessimistic commentary, and like Zuboff is like telling, him, telling us all how bad Google is, and people like my friend Richard Seymour are writing about how, how Twitter can really make you go crazy. But it's also inescapable, you know, all the, the, the revival of the political left in Britain is completely impossible without Facebook. I mean, it's entirely dependent on Facebook. Facebook is what made it happen. Like, without Facebook, it provided the necessary infrastructure for it to happen, and um, and I always remember being and yeah you know, I and um, and it, you know it was also so I think um, I think you know it, it's not something to be optimistic or pessimistic about really it's about really seeing where the dangers are and seeing where the possibilities are it's about identifying in any given moment but I do think it's true and I do think it's true that we've left it, the, the, in terms of a sort of um, a generally kind of Marxist perspective, uh, the, 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 the phase on, the, the specific phase on capitalism, as I and others would, would contextualise it, that we've, that we've sort of left behind, which is the one that was sort of initiated in the early 80s, sort of post fordist phase, it was particularly difficult for the left. Like, it was very, very difficult. People said at the time it was going to be really difficult for the left. People like Eric Hobsbawm got kind of attacked by the left of the left for saying it was going to be really difficult, and look, it was really difficult. I mean, really, <laughs> because it depended upon particular tendencies in the organisation of production and distribution, which were all about globalisation, about diversifying markets. The entire social logic of that shift in, in, in capitalism was about fragmenting communities, fragmenting collectivities, you know, frag and individualisation. Whereas the current phase, it partly it depends on a, a, an extraordinary concentration of capital in Silicon Valley, like nothing we've ever seen before, and an extraordinary concentration of a certain kind of power, but it also depends on certain logics of aggregation, that it, that it, you know, whether they want to or not, you know, Google, YouTube and Facebook ha have to constitute this incredible public sphere of a kind which really like the left in the 80s and 90s could, could, could barely dream of you know, having access to. So, um, much as like the, the phase before that, the mid twenties, the mid twentieth century phase, afforded, you know, created all made possible really, really terrible things. It made possible fascism. It made possible Stalinism. But it also made possible the New Deal. It made possible Western European social democracy. I think we are now in a new phase, which is why it carries great dangers. It also does carry enormous possibilities. Um, so I, well, that's what I would say. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> I think that the pessimistic side is, uh, of our situation is that we are approaching uh, the end of the, of the panel. Uh, the, post, the optimistic is that uh, we are approaching a coffee break. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your presentations. Thank you for your presentations.